my interest in um, girls and autism really started probably back in 1999 uh, when I was running a residential boarding house in an independent school where middle class parents so kids don't have difficulties, do they? Uh, well, that certainly was the belief of senior management at the time. We had no educational psychology support, no clinical psychology support, and uh, we didn't do a particularly good job with 5% of kids who didn't fit the neurotypical category. And I got interested in autism because of one boy who came to me. But when, when I started learning, uh, and it was a very, very steep learning curve at the time, I knew a lot less about autism even than I do now. But when I looked around in my boarding house of about 85 young people between the ages of 10 and 13, I identified seven who I thought were at risk of being on the autism spectrum. I'm sorry if at risk sounds a bit negative, but you know what I mean, that I, I thought might, might hit the criteria. And there were three girls. Um, and I, I had this gut instinct, this intuition, that these girls were just hanging on by their fingertips in some ways. They were struggling to integrate with their peer group. They had certain uh, characteristics like the need for routines and rituals and structure and so on. Um, but at the time, I didn't have the confidence. And I think there's, there's an issue, I think, back to, to what was said earlier today about the age at which someone finds out. And particularly with girls who seem very adept at masking um, some of their difficulties, that those... those uh, there's, there's little signs, and I know from a very close family member, I'm scratching my head and I'm wondering if I'm a bit like Tony Atwood, who recently, even in the last few days, came out and said, well, I missed my son. You know, he, for 30 years, I missed the fact that my son is on the autism spectrum. And similarly, um, a girl who only crosses, crosses a pavement at certain points, who will only use certain types of cutlery, who will only listen to the television if, or watch television if it's on a volume setting of 5, 10 or 15, who has quite rigid um, uh, dietary requirements in terms of you know, becoming a vegan, but suddenly she's a vegan all the way through and wondering, is, is this just a, a, a no, an aspect of no, a normal personality, part of this great heterogeneity of human personality? Or is there something there that should lead us down the, the route of saying, a, a, you know, perhaps she's on the spectrum? So, so I, come, I, I, I wouldn't claim to be an expert at all in girls and ASD. I think there are a lot of questions to be asked. And since becoming independent um, and working as an independent educational consultant, what I've found is, yes, I'm dealing with a lot of school issues because school seems to be very, very big common stories about girls coping in school and, and teachers saying there's nothing wrong, we don't see any difference, and then parents saying, but hang on, life is hell at home, it's hell for us, it's hell, hell for her, and trying to get some, some recognition that girls can present very differently in, in those different domains. But recently I've become uh, involved in issues around gender, and sadly one of my, my very first clients um, uh, took their own life earlier this year, uh, be because of the, uh, a range of issues, but the, the confusion around gender identity and this association with autism, which I think is very interesting uh, and needs further exploration. The area that I, I've, I, I've been dragged into, kicking and screaming, um, and which will be relevant, I think, to, to many in the audience today, is that of statutory services, as they were described, um, looking at families affected by autism, looking at mums with autism, looking at family situations in which a child has autism, <coughs> and being misjudged and finding uh, very, very tragic. I, I, I find it very upsetting because A, I don't get paid for any of the work I'm doing, but B, I, I'm seeing a huge amount of human misery um, caused by a lack of understanding of why a child is presenting in a particular way. And this, the standard approach being, oh, there are attachment issues or there's neglect or, or something happening in the home situation. So I find myself attending children's panels, going to court hearings and so on, and realising that the system just isn't up to speed. It's not a system that understands or is sympathetic uh, to the, those complex dynamics that may take place within a family. And my, my gut <coughs> feeling is that what we need is far more specialised support really early on to prevent situations escalating out of control. So, so that's my background. I'm a bit of a, a fraud, I suppose, by being male and, and supposedly neurotypical, but uh, that's me. <coughs> Um, my, 
the, the charge today was to, and this is going to be incredibly boring after the wonderful uh, talk we heard this morning. We'll wake you up before lunch, uh, if, if that helps. But this, this is really about ex executive control functions, because many parents will, in the report from the paediatrician or the, um, from the CALMS clinician, will, will receive a diagnosis and will understand that autism is associated with certain weaknesses in uh, cognitive processes, particularly central coherence, theory of mind, and executive functioning. And I don't know how, how much information is then provided about what we un understand by those, those terms. And there may be a risk of thinking those as being separate boxes, that you've got a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of the other, and that they don't interrelate. But of course they do interrelate. And I think that by gaining an understanding of what they are and how they work together, you can uh, get an understanding of those um, difficulties that some young, young people and adults will face, particularly around behaviour. And uh, I'm going to be looking at meltdowns and tantrums and meltdowns a wee bit. We won't have a huge amount of time to do that, but that's one of the sort of uh, areas where I think it can be really, really helpful if you're a practitioner, if you're a school teacher, if you're uh, even at home, understanding perhaps what the meltdown is and, and understanding ways of managing it. So, um, that's a sort of br uh, brief itinerary of what I intend to go through. What are executive control functions? Where, how do they impact on, on learning, on behaviour, on social interaction and general quality of life? And then we'll do Q&As at the end. And I don't mind if you, if you disagree with anything I say. I apologise in advance for any faux pas. Um, I will use the term autism. Uh, I know some people don't like whether it's an autistic disorder or an autistic condition or whatever. Uh, I get bogged down with, with some of the different terminologies, but um, if, I, if I make a mistake, then just let me know. I'm fairly thick-skinned. Big, the big issue, of course, is that the problem in generalising, that the autistic population is very heterogeneous. So um, in terms of cognitive ability, in terms of functioning, in terms of sensory issues and so on. And, of course, a lot of diagnostic um, overshadowing. Autism is best perhaps thought of less as a category than uh, a, dimension, a, 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 a condition that expresses itself dimensionally. And it overlaps with very many other conditions. So the, the common pattern for me in some of the clients that, that come to me is that the child has been diagnosed with something else first. And it will often be something like ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder. And it's only later on that they get the diagnosis of autism. Sometimes it can work the other way around. But, but uh, research is demonstrating that if you go to outpatient clinics, even at the Maudsley where they did a very big study recently, the outpatient clinics for eating disorders, for suicidal ideation, for self-harm, for anxiety, for depression, substance use disorder. When you look at the population, those populations, what comes through are neurodevelopmental disorders and in particular autism and in particular attention disorders. And they're missed. So the, the experts in eating disorders and the experts in anxiety and depression may actually themselves not have the expertise to be able to tease apart some of the other issues which are underlying um, the, those presenting difficulties and in particular autism. So it's it also important to look at dynamism through the lifespan that a, a girl who has autism age 11 is going to present very differently when she's 16, 17, 18, as was alluded to this morning. And the whole idea of epigenetics. If we, if we were to understand child development, this probably gives us a framework for best understanding how our genetic inheritance <coughs> and the environment in which we find ourselves and which we put ourselves can interact to lead to the, the, the presentations and the, the, the genotypes and phenotypes that develop. What we also, I think, can say is there's a, there's a lack of research and we need to know a lot more about, specifically about <coughs> girls and the, the specific difficulties that girls will face as they grow up into becoming young women, becoming perhaps um, mums uh, and uh, being involved in families. And then also the elderly, because if we think of the current prevalence estimates of what 1.5, 1.6%, and we look at the number of elderly who are diagnosed with autism, it's a tiny, tiny number. And there's, there's inevitably going to be confusion around issues such as Alzheimer's and dementia and what are autistic difficulties that are being faced. And you would approach those in different ways. Um, my, my interest is in particular in the vulnerable, at-risk young people and the looked-after population. And what, what is very clear from research and from personal experience is that there are kids going into the system who shouldn't be in the system, and the system doesn't serve them particularly well. So three cognitive differences associated with this. Yeah, I've just been through theory of mind differences, uh, we, central coherence um, and executive function deficits. Notice the heavy emphasis on the negatives, on the disability, 
perhaps we need to move away from that way of talking and thinking. Um, Francesca Happy talks about autism as being a cognitive style, and I like that. A, a di just a different way of processing the world, making sense of the world, and therefore uh, working with the world or working in the world. And uh, here we go, a very busy slide. Uh, too busy, and in fact, I'm only putting that up to, to demonstrate the complexity. Executive con control functions are not uh, domain-specific in the brain. So, if you think about language, language belongs in certain parts of the brain, or a certain part of the brain. Memory, working memory, long-term memory, and so on. The prefrontal cortex involved with uh, organisation and processing, domain-specific. Whereas executive functions, I think the, the best... Um, uh, example I could give or allude to is the idea of that computer in your car. If you think of your car as having a cooling system, having a combustion system and having an electrical system, those three systems have to work together and it's the computer that does that. The executive control function is that's what it really refers to. So it's not referring to specific uh, functions that occur in a particular domain in the brain, it's rather where those functions pull together. And we use we use them, uh, those of us who are neurotypical probably use them to a very high level without even thinking about them. So, for example, on the M8 this morning, queue of traffic, am I going to get here in, on time? I'm able to think through exactly, I'm able to look at the timing, I'm able to look at alternative strategies if the road is blocked, I'm able to put into perspective the fact, if I'm late, does it really matter? You know, if, if my routine changes, if, if that sequence of events isn't going to take place, then I can do something else. And that, of course, means that I can manage my anxiety a lot better than someone who can't do that. Again, one of the themes that I was very pleased came through so strongly this morning is the issue around anxiety, because it's my belief, having worked at local authority level, being called into those crisis situations, that if you go in with an understanding of of anxiety, of what autism is in terms of anxiety, you can make a very, very big difference very, very quickly to a young person's experience of school. And it can be around, it can be around uh, for example, demands being made to attend assembly. Do you have to go to assembly? Does it really matter if a young person doesn't go to assembly? Does it really matter if they wear slightly different clothing because of the sensory needs? I think that the DERM principle is one that I apply quite a lot. But in terms of executive functions, you can see there that working memory, the, the ability to hold information and manipulate it and make sense of it, the ability to reflect on one's own behaviours and to inhibit certain responses, the cognitive flexibility to take one particular way of thinking and then to, th to think it through in it from a different angle, and uh, those lead to these higher, these higher order executive functions that we're, we're discussing. I prefer this diagram. I'll give you a minute to have a quick look through it. This is from Tom Brown, and it, it organises it in a much, what well, I think is a much more logical way, and it's, a, it's an easier way. I would f prefer to take this into a training session I was doing with teachers than the previous diagram. And so the ex executive functions, activation, focus, effort, emotion, memory, and action. And in particular, the ability to manipulate those or to organise those in such a way to get a, a positive outcome. Uh, what I think you'll probably find is that, uh, and this description I think is also very apt. Remember, this has nothing to do with intelligence. So if, if a young person or an adult has difficulties with executive functions, it's not because they don't have intelligence. It will often be because they struggle to pull those intelligences together in such a way that positive outcomes can be achieved. So described as like a disorganized cook, you've got everything there in place. There's nothing wrong with the brain. It's, more, it's nothing wrong with the brain in terms of intelligence. It's the way that those uh, capacities and abilities are used together. And I, I think of it, probably my translation is it's cognitive multitasking. Right? So, um, and it's something, as I say, that we use on a regular basis. Uh, there's only probably one person in the room at the moment who is working at a high level of executive functioning, and that's me. Because you're not under pressure. You can sit there, you can absorb... Um, your mind may be on other matters altogether, and I wouldn't blame you. Maybe you're thinking about lunch, which isn't too far away, what you're going to do this afternoon, what your son or daughter are doing at school, etc. <coughs> but um, I'm the one who's got to have almost like a PowerPoint in my head of thinking, as I start a sentence, where is this sentence going to finish? How is it going to lead on to the next one? How is this slide going to lead on to the next slide? I'm trying to read your facial expressions. If I see people yawning at the back, so be warned. 
then I, I know that I'm losing you. <coughs> if I get, if you start looking at your watches, then I know also that I'm going to be losing you. So all those processes are taking place. I'm under, I'm under a lot of pressure, in a sense, which I'm, I hope I'm coping with. But, but you, you are not. I, I could easily um, reverse roles, and I could ask someone in the room to come up and stand on stage. I wonder how many, how many heartbeats have just gone up when I said that. <laughs> I've just invested in, um, uh, from a tech company in Canada, uh, a... a what, what is a device that is intended at aiming to measure anxiety levels through thermal conductivity on the skin that children can wear or adults can wear and it links to an app on a phone which shows stress levels and I'm, I'm thinking this could be incredibly useful because as was pointed out earlier we don't always know when those stress levels are rising and wouldn't it be very useful particularly where we're in a school situation where we're looking at challenging behaviour or difficult behaviours, or for the, just the health and well-being of the young person themselves, if we can work out how those stress levels are changing throughout the course of the day. And where there's a peak is understanding what does that peak <coughs> coincide with. For many young people in school, it's break time, or it's lunch time, or it's getting on the school bus, or, or it's a transition home, or a transition between lesson or corridors, or whatever. Having that information could be, objective information could be incredibly useful. Um, and it would be very interesting to see how, as I alluded to before, how stress occurring at one part of the day can relate to an event later in the day. Because I think as parents, what comes, what comes through to me from discussions I've had is that very often the meltdown that occurs at 7.30 at night is linked to an event that occurred at 11 in the morning. Uh, and, and if you can make those links and make sense of that, then obviously the things you can put in place to, to deal with them. So... Um, Difficulty organising tasks um, and identifying what is important. W what I find with the young people who come, who are at university level, very, very high functioning at university level, is that they're often, some of their understanding is exposed, particularly the ability to synthesise information and to prioritise. In subjects such as English, for example, or where you, you, a lot of the work is narrative, and they will find, they'll spend quite a lot of time going into a huge amount of detail about certain aspects of what an essay question is asking, but not getting the bigger picture and, and therefore not giving the answers that, that's, that's required. It's not a lack of intelligence at all. It's the, it's the ability to understand what is lying beneath the essay question. And it, this is a, an example from a young lady who I know very well, um, who came to me very... Now, she would be about 14 at the time, and she came to me extremely distressed by that question. Now, this is a girl who got eight grade A's at higher. She's got four advanced hires, and she's got a first in aeronautical engineering. So she's a bright cookie, but very distressed about that question. Is there any... Can anyone understand that? And she said it is a joke question, isn't it? In the space below, draw a diagram of the apparatus you would use to separate sand from a solution of salt water. How, yes, how, do you, how do you get sand out of a solution of salt and water? There is no sand there, so how can you get it out? And of course what the question is actually asking is, in, in a solution of sand, salt and water, how do you get the sand out? But it's not written like that. And, and those of us who are neurotypical read the question and make sense of it, even though it's, it's incomplete. And it perhaps exposes... Uh, one of the issues, um, I suppose you could call it over, being over-literal or over-logical, but actually it's just being literal and it's just being logical. Uh, that logically, you can't get sand out of a solution of salt and water. So the way, way we use language, whether it's verbal or written, uh, as neurotypicals, we're very imprecise, but we manage to get away with it because we, we read meaning into things that, where the meaning perhaps isn't there. Um, so in terms, yeah, Bob's lost the sequence of his thoughts. That's me uh, most mornings, but uh, it, it, executive functioning is the ability to shift from task, to prioritise and then shift from task and sustain attention. One of the, the interesting pieces of uh, information that's come through some of the big data project in America on autism, taking information from, from ADOS, um, <coughs> from ADOS uh, databases is the fact that underlying a lot of ASD are these attentional deficits that we can sometimes lump together as ADHD, but are, may not be, may, may be, may be separate altogether. <coughs> but attention is, is, seems to be in some way impaired or some way it seems to be different. And w when we look at, if, because one of my other interest areas is ADHD, 
A lot of people think that the hyperactivity and the impulsivity in that population, those are the, the, the key areas that cause the most difficulty. Because you think of that in terms of kids running out of the road and getting knocked down or making impulsive decisions that cause them uh, huge difficulty. But actually the attention is the problem because if you're not attending, you're not picking up social skills. If you're not picking up social skills, then you're going to be isolated quite quickly within your group. And that, that seems to be the case with some of the high-functioning adults women that I encounter is that actually the differences between them and their neurotypical colleagues are very subtle but they're so subtle that they, they become severe and it can be laughing too loud at your own jokes it can be in terms of uh, where you stand in relation to your colleagues it can be just not picking up on those social cues and it, there's, a, there's an irony I suppose that the higher functioning you are the more difficult life can be uh, again, speaking to a couple of parents the other day, one who had a son who was learning impaired and had a, was in residential services and, and had a very high quality of life. The other parent of a boy who was higher functioning, but, but not as happy with it because they had the level of awareness to understand that they were different and they wanted friendship, but they didn't know how to achieve it. And the, the most difficult cases that I deal with at school level are those, those girls who really want to fit in, really want the friendship, but they, they can't get there and because their peer group aren't accommodating of them. And that's something that I suspect is, uh, is something that's familiar to you. So in terms of, in terms of uh, executive functions, the ability to sustain attention when su sustaining attention is needed on the important things, whether it's a conversation you're having with, with a member of your peer group or whether it's something that's happening in the classroom. And misses implied meaning in spoken and written word. I, I think, again, from the presentation this morning, that, that came through that there's a missing out of, of information. Therefore, it's much more difficult to fit into a group. Again, the reason why I became involved more, had become more involved with girls and specifically with autism was at local authority level, one of the patterns that I saw was of 12, 13 year olds um, at secondary school, so S1, end of S1, S2, who were falling off the edge with no diagnosis. And they were labelled, they would go through two routes. One was down the, the, the guidance route and it would be challenging behaviour or it would be non-attendance or it would be mental health difficulties. Um, and, the, and the other route was through support for learning. But what was common to all of those is when you traced back, because that that's what fascinated me, these girls went on to get diagnosis of autism, but it was only at the ages of 12 or 13. When you traced back to the primary school, and you called the primary school and said, Jessica, tell me about Jessica, because she was with you about three or four years ago. They would say, yeah, she was, she was always on the outside of the group. Um, she, she, was, she sometimes played, but she, didn't really, she wasn't really proactive in the group. She, didn't, she wasn't very conversational. And you could see those little markers there. And they were subtle. They were subtle, but they were still there. And these were the girls, by the time 12, 13 was coming along, they were experiencing quite considerable difficulties. And, and it would have been much nicer if we'd have been able to get in and do some work earlier on. Regulating alertness, effort and processing speed. Uh, this, this, I think, again, is what was alluded to this morning in terms of anxiety. And what some of the interventions and supports that you generate yourself, or, or, as were illustrated, are extremely powerful. List making is one of the most powerful things you can do. And I use it myself because I, I'm more ADHD than ASD. And what I do is I procrastinate. So... The bank statement comes through, and I know it's not going to be pleasant, so I don't open it. I put it on a pile. And the next bank statement, and the credit card, and my wife's brilliant. Uh, she does things like open bank statements, which is just, <laughs> no, how, how does that happen? Uh, so, so she's very organised, and the reason that uh, I'm not in a ditch with a gin bottle at the moment, uh, or in poverty, is because I'm, I, I did the, the most important thing, which is to marry someone who is organised. And, and that, that is the, the top, top technique I, I would use. But list, list making is powerful, and it's powerful for, for a number of reasons. One is that this overwhelming sense, because you, you procrastinate so much and you put things off doing those really, really boring, mundane things that you know you need to do, they build up, and you get this overwhelming sense of the things that haven't been done and that need to be done. And when you actually write them down and put them on the list, in a list form, it visualises it in a much more concrete way, and it, and it takes away the vagueness of the undone tasks and, and it, it presents them visually and clearly and concretely. And 
The real beauty is as you do those tasks, which always take a lot less time than you thought they would, and you tick them off or put a line through them, you get a, a tremendous positive feedback that you're achieving something and progressing. Now that is important, I think, not just for those of us who are adults facing some of the difficulties we face, but for young people. And I think in the, in, w one of the things I did towards the end of my, when I was still teaching, was I started teaching neurotypical classes as if they had autism. And I, I gave them, when they came in at the start of a two-year course, I gave them the syllabus and the breakdown. And every time we went through a particular topic, we crossed that topic off. And, and it, it was amazing. They thought I was the most organised teacher in the world. Well, in fact, the most badly organised teacher in the world. They thought that I was incredibly well organised because what I was doing was actually recognising that they need to know where they are. They need that structure. And I don't think it's just about autism. I think it's about being a child sometimes that we need to give them far clearer idea of where we're heading, what that structure is. So, and in terms of um, processing speed, then th this is where it gets difficult. It, I, I think one of the... the best analogies I had uh, was provided to me was by a psychologist who said that for some of these kids that getting them to write things down is a bit like going back from broadband to dial-up. If you had to do that now, in all the work you do, in all the sort of uh, social media stuff you do, if you, every time you went on the computer, you had to dial-up, for those of you who can remember, and think of the frustration of waiting for a page to load. For a lot of our kids, that, that's the difficulty that they have that the ideas that are coming into the head disappear quite quickly. They find it mechanically and physically very difficult to get that handwriting down uh, in a way that's a, that's, that they, they would agree is a, of a satisfactory standard. And it's just an incredible grind, which is where technology can come in. So uh, completing tasks on time. Difficulties also, as you'll appreciate, in, in being perfectionist, that you make one mistake on a page, you have to start again. Not ever having a sense of being able to complete anything. And to be honest, in, in the world, in, in the academic world, you have to, you can never be perfect. You've got to submit work that is never going to be what you want. Um, Sarah has written books. I bet in every book she would go back and think, ah, I, could, I could do it different, I could, I could improve it in some way. But, but actually for a lot of our kids, they find that very, very difficult to do. And so completion and accepting the fact that um, you're never going to get it perfect is, is a... Is a, is a a talent that those of us who don't struggle with take for granted. Managing frustration, modulating emotion. Again, recognising that, that horrible feeling in the pit of your stomach. What is that? You, you feel bad, but being able to put a specific label to it, such as anxiety, or perhaps frustration, or perhaps anger, or just feeling detached, whatever those... And I don't think even our, our vocabulary is adequate as it is to cope with the broad range of emotions that we feel. But if you don't understand and you can't label your own emotions, it becomes very difficult to employ techniques such as cognitive behavioural techniques uh, in order to overcome difficulties. Can't put to the back of my mind. Um, I, I wonder how, how often, uh, as Sarah said this morning, the, the fact that you've made a mistake. Everyone else has moved on, but you keep dwelling on it and you keep going back to it, and you keep wanting to apologise or in some ways right a wrong that's happened two weeks ago, two years ago, 20 years ago. And then utilising working memory and accessing recall. One of the areas that I think that is very interesting here is, well, two areas, uh, around the use of words. One is the ability of applying tags to memory so that memories can be, achieved more, can be retrieved more quickly and made sense of and synthesised, which I think is a lot about what, how we manage our behaviour, that those of us who are neurotypical may have a higher level of ability in terms of accessing memory. And the way we access memory may be through the, the tagging of memories and tagging of emotions. But also, um, I've lost my train of thought, uh, uh, words, I'm going to move on because I can't think. Yes, sorry, um, <laughs> private speech. Um, I wrote to Tony Atwood some time ago because when I was developing a model to use in in my, have I run out of time already? Uh, you've got a few minutes left. Cheapest. Um, because, <laughs> yeah, okay. I was going to look at the crisis cycle and how, how executive control, time, and it relates to what I've just been saying. Private speech. What, those of us who are, claim to be neurotypical, um, use private speech a lot, or private speech is there. In other words, private speech is that commentary in your head. 
that is going on and on and on all the time, all the time. And it's not always in your own voice. It can sometimes be in someone else's voice. But you've got this continual inner private speech. And kids, you'll see young kids who use it um, but externalise it. So you, you'll see a group of kids standing around, let's say, a table with a railway train on a track, and they'll be talking. But they won't be talking to each other so much as talking to themselves. And now I'm going to put the train on the track. Don't you, do, do, do. And it's not a conversation, it's, it's that speech that then becomes internalised. And that's, that, that's a resource that we use. Um, so driving on the M8 this morning, I had that commentary in my head saying, it doesn't matter if you're going to be late, etc., etc. The way we, that I have used um, executive control functions in terms of behaviour management and behaviour support at school is helping teachers understand the crisis cycle. And I, I, I think a crisis cycle is something that you're probably familiar with, where this axis is indicating intensity of emotion or arousal level, and this is a period of time. That period of time can last from a few seconds to several hours, if not days. But generally speaking, at the moment, you are functioning down here with a very, very relatively low arousal level, unless I was to call your name and ask you to stand up. So you, you're, you're relatively calm. Um, there'll be times, for example, when you're driving home, when you'll need to use a lot of your brain functions together. You'll need to do that plate spinning or that uh, multi cognitive multitasking, as we called it. And there are, there are, there's an intensity that you may find up here. And some people in the room, whether you are 10, 11, 12 years old, or 30, 40, 50 years old, there will be times when you will get at the stage where you have that, what I would call a meltdown, not a tantrum, a meltdown. So this is, this is a neurotypical model, and what, what I describe is situations when, if you're under pressure, at this point here, certain inhibitors will kick in. And those inhibitors, if you're neurotypical, include things like self-awareness, the ability to stand back and look at yourself as others, others might see you, a sense of how you're portraying yourself to others, um, a, a sense that if I have a meltdown in Tesco's car park, then it's going to be a bit embarrassing. And those, in, those inhibit the escalation of emotion. When we... There we go. As if by magic. Uh, when we look at those who, who enter an unstable state, then this is what pr principally, this is where I think executive control, control functions help us understand behaviour. It's really about disorganised thinking. It's about the emotionality that comes that's disorgan that, that is disorganised because it can't be or, or isn't being organised. And there is a reduced sense of proportion and perspective. So, for example, if you have a minor accident in Tesco's car park, then those of us who are relatively neurotypical will tend to stand back and say, well, it's only a scratch car. It's not a big thing. It's not a big deal. Yes, my schedule is being disrupted. I'll have to phone the insurance company. And we organise our thinking. That internal dialogue takes place that allows us to deal with it. But if you think of a young child who uh, is expecting a particular set of events and is in some ways thwarted at the beginning of the day, the rest of the day can fall to, can fall to pieces. So... When we start looking, and this is the, that's the HPA axis and the, the stress response, we don't need to go into all the, the complex chemicals that are taking place, other than to get this sense, and it's really helpful to kids to understand this, that at the same time that you have the red stuff going on, which is the, inf the inflamed emotions, the anger, the upset, you've also got um, a contradictory response, which is the, what I call the Gaviscon effect from the Gaviscon advert, the, the hosing down of the indigestion. And those two things take place at the same time. And the, the beauty of understanding a bit of the chemistry is that we can also understand the psychology. And this is where you can kick in with some of the cognitive behavioural approaches uh, in, in communicating with children about their behaviours. So if we think... That, to me, is what I, the, the model I would use with what a lot of the young people and perhaps adults who, who do experience these meltdowns and, and whatever, that your executive control functions are likely to be less effective. So there is a smaller window of opportunity. Most young people going into school are already at a high st state of arousal. It doesn't take a lot to tip them uh, into a more unstable state. And the, but, but interestingly, not only is the escalation very rapid, very often the de-escalation is equally as rapid. Whereas for you and I, if, if, I, if I had a, a meltdown, I would be dwelling on it for hours afterwards, thinking, oh, I'm so embarrassed, why did I say that, why did I do that, etc., etc. Um, but, but I think that the, the interesting thing also is post-crisis, what happens next? And I have a, a lovely example... I have a lovely example of a young child where I, I was called into school um, because the police were called. He's a seven-year-old boy, and the police were called to primary school. And, uh, yeah, I know. Um, but the, the incident involved him bringing a knife into school 
because they were doing craft work, so he brought his own craft knife in, and it turned into a whole horrible set of events with the police being called. But the, in reading the narrative report, this youngster had been up here and then was calmed down by the janitor and was sitting with the janitor having a chat, at which point the head teacher decided, this is only about ten minutes after the incident, decided to say, now why did you bring that knife into school? That was a very bad thing to do. And of course what you then got is a, is a, a re-escalation. So, um, yeah, I haven't really done justice to the whole topic of executive control functions, I have run out of time, for which I do apologise. But I, what I would suggest is that I think it's worth exploring um, in understanding particularly the way young people, um, some of the difficulties they face on a daily basis. But it, I think it also gives us some idea of this, the techniques, the direct techniques we can use when a child is in crisis, of particular words and phrases and visual symbols that are not to do with pretending that this trigger event hasn't taken place, but more accelerating through the process into a more stable state. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just going to ask you a question. I mean, it's not just young people. It's, it's no, all know. through the lifetime, isn't it? <coughs> you know, so what you're talking about is actually learning strategies to understand what the processes are so you can start actually putting things in place to, to help deal with them. Yes. I still need to write this, you know. I, I think the, the techniques we saw this morning, if we got to the end, they, they'll be the same. Um, I survived because of Microsoft Outlook. Uh, and the emails and my calendar and be able to print it out and access it. I was, I was, dread I was hopeless. I would still be hopeless if I didn't have that sort of support behind. And I, d I do, uh, the term scaffolding I think is really useful. And it's recognising, I think, that in very highly talented people, those, those who are high functioning in particular, that small support put in place can mean that these folk can realise their potential. And, and I, I, the reason I, I say it with authority is because I'm like that. That I, I would function, I function much better with an organised wife and I would function much better with a, a secretary or a PA. Take those away, I, I don't think I'd be standing here just now. I think, I think I'd be in a bit of a mess.